In this program, we're going to trace the development of trolleys from 1903 to the present. We're going to look at some still pictures of trolleys, some old postcards, as well as visit one of the local trolley museums. And there's a lot of history around Boston area as far as trolleys and trains are concerned, and we're going to learn a little bit about that. And we're also going to be taking a journey on the various rapid transit lines, and we'll see what that's like and spend a day traveling on the subway. So please join us. And have some fun. When Fran fell, he called for help. But the only ones there were ignorance, incompetence, indifference. Fran called for help again. Confusion came instead. At last, help came. Help knew what to do. In times of emergency, are you help? Learn Red Cross First Aid, where you work or call your local chapter. Public transportation. For many of us, commuting to and from work is just a fact of life. The first streetcar in America was a horse-drawn streetcar, and it was built in 1832, and it was put to service in New York City. We're going to start our program with a horse-drawn streetcar that was in New Bedford, Massachusetts, around 1872, and that would be the streetcar on the right that's got the name Oxford on it. Then next to it on the left, we have a cable car. Cable cars were used as an alternative after the horse-drawn streetcars were no longer practical. Around 1884, steam-powered trolley cars were built, but they weren't very, very practical. They were noisy, and they caused a lot of pollution. This is an example of a box car, trolley car, and this was the type of trolley car that was used from around 1905 to about 1929. When we had trolley cars in the Hunt, we had a Nahant line and a Swampskit line and a Marblehead line. This is the type of trolley car that they used. They were very, very popular, but they haven't been used after 1924. We're at the Wonderland Station, the northernmost point of the Blue Line. Joe, why didn't it go any further than Revere? I think they ran out of money, but they claim they're going to go to Central Square and Lynn. Commuters will definitely appreciate that. I will, too. Tell me a little bit about the difference between subways and trolleys and commuter rails. People really can get confused. When we start with commuter rails are trains, regular trains that are used to carry people in and out of the city very efficiently. We're right now, we're in what used to be called a subway car because they originated in the subway, but real, really the correct name is rapid transit because you see right now we're not below the ground, but we will be once we get into Maverick Station. And trolley cars originally were surface cars and the reason they were called trolley cars is because they have a little spindle on top of them called a trolley that attaches itself to a wire where they get their power. From around 1903 till around the middle 1920s, we call this the golden age of trolley cars because there were trolley cars everywhere. Every little town had its own trolley car system or it was connected to a larger trolley car system and they had special trolley cars for VIPs. Now this is what we call a parlor car. This is the interior of the same parlor car and I think you can notice how luxurious it was. Joe, I've grown up using T's, but you know it took me so long to figure out how this map works. Well, there are several rapid transit lines in Boston. The green line is really trolley cars that go to Commonwealth Avenue, that go to Beacon Street, that go to Northeastern, that go to Riverside, that go to North Station, Leechmere, the Science Museum. 
Then we have the orange line, which is a rapid transit system similar to the one that we were on, similar to the blue line. It goes all the way from Oak Grove in Malden all the way to Forest Hills. Then the red line begins in All Life, which is in Cambridge, goes through Harvard Square, and it branches. It can go to Mattapan or Braintree. And then we have the blue line that we were just on. It begins at Bowdoin and goes all the way to Wonderland. So it's just a way of helping you color code your way around Boston. So if someone gives you directions, they might say, how do you get to Revere Beach? And they'll say, take the blue line, get on at Government Center, and get off at Revere Beach. It, just it covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? It certainly does. It's the heart of the system. You really feel like you're out in the world when you're riding on a subway. You, you meet other people, and you can see the Bostonians going to and from work and talk to people. How do you feel about taking the tea? Um, I don't really mind it because I don't drive, so it's not a matter of beating the traffic because I don't have a license, so it's just a matter of getting to work. It's tough driving out there, so this is a lot more convenient. It's easy. Where are you gentlemen from? Um, England and Wales. How do you feel about the Boston subway? Um, I think it's um, really nice, but I've lost my teapot. <laughs> do you have anything like this in England? Um, we've got the London Underground, but it's slightly more expensive, but very similar. Well, we just needed the transportation, because like, it's crowded. Do you like the subway? It's all right. It smells. I don't know, you've got air conditioning over here and we don't have that over there as much, no. So it's um, a lot nicer in this hot weather. Is anything like this in Maine? No, nothing like that. Yeah. You wish you did? Yes, yeah. definitely. Do you think once you get your license you'll still use the tea? Yeah, because the traffic is unbelievable. It's a lot more convenient than driving in, especially with all the traffic. And, uh, it makes a lot more, it, it's good for students I think, because Boston is such a college town that, that it's uh, just going, I have so many friends in all the different schools, it just makes it really easy for me. We are at the train station in Swampscott. This is the commuter rail station, not to be confused with the subway stations in Boston. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the differences. The commuter rail is nothing more than a train that takes people to and from places where they want to go. And the subway stations have subway cars or rapid transit cars that take people in and about the city. And trolley cars are electric cars that work by cables above the trolley car itself was where they get their electric power. And this particular building is being restored as we speak, and it's a great thing because it has certainly has a lot of history. It's a very old and beautiful building, but speaking of, of restorations, I know that where can we find trolley cars that are being restored? I know they've got to be someplace, but you can tell us where we can find them. If you take a trip up to the Seashore Museum in Kennebunkport, Maine, there is one complete section in which they restore old trolley cars. Looking over the visit from the visitors gallery of the restoration shop of the trolley museum, and you can see uh, from here some of the different projects that we have ongoing. The closest one to you is a New Orleans car, number 966, and this car came to us somewhat as a basket case, and uh, we're doing a complete top to bottom job. As you can see right here, we have a new roof. All the boards that you see are new, built over a fairly sound frame. Looking down here in the front of the car, you see a new front uh, down at the bottom that's called a crown piece, that half round piece, and new posts, and the framing is pretty good. Cars that come from uh, the south don't tend to have much rust on them uh, from below, as we have here with salt uh, up in New England. You're all familiar with it in your cars, but uh, they have a lot of humidity, and so they rot out from the top. Right over uh, next to it is a car from Dallas, Texas that originally, or that before it came here, ran in Boston on the Mattapan High Speed Line, and we're restoring it back to as it was in Dallas, Texas. That's called a PCC car, and that's a fairly modern car built in 1945. Right in front of it, on the same track, I don't know whether you can focus on where it says elevated or not, is a car from the Eastern Mass Street Railway, and they had those in Lynn and Swampscott and all around there. Uh, this particular one last ran in Stoneham in 1945, and it was about our fourth car, and we uh, just finished restoring it after six years. It started July 1981 and was finished July 1987. And it would be operating today except uh, one of its motors failed and we had to pull it out and we'll be sending it down to Boston to be rewound. Just to the right of that car 
is a car from Brooklyn, and uh, that also came in in July 1981 and is just about to complete its, uh, well, it's in its seventh year of restoration, and hopefully before the seventh year is over, it'll be all done. This car was used originally on the Beachmont to uh, government center line, it used to be called Scully Square. And uh, then in 1920, when the uh, Pay State Street Railway became the Eastern Mass, they sold off the Newport, uh, Rhode Island division, and this car was transferred to the Newport Electric Company. It ran there until about 1926, Newport to Fall River. And uh, then they went to buses and the car was sold to the uh, Coast Cities Railway in New Jersey, in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and uh, operated there until they uh, began to cut down their lines and went to buses. And then it became a summer camp for 45 years, and then it was rescued by us. Where, where do you think these cars would have run? Well, I remember them when I was a kid. I used to go from Maverick Station to Revere Beach via Chelsea, mm -hmm. and this was the Chelsea line to Revere Beach, and I remember it being very obnoxious. <laughs> My mother would say, now let's get this streetcar, and I'd say, no, I want to go on the one with the straw seats. Uh, but this is the classic car, a classic New England car, and an interesting thing about this, well, we actually have one, two, three different cars of different types beside each other. This one was called a semi-convertible. And semi, in fact, my mother-in-law from Portland, Maine, calls it a semi-convertible shut open, which was what uh, in Portland they used to call them. Notice this pocket. The window drops down in here. This other one goes up. And that way you can semi convert it to an open car, not completely. The one beside us is a convertible car. I don't know whether you can see that through there or not, but you get the uh, panels, which are for winter time, or take them out for summertime. Now this car beside us from Brooklyn is uh, a convertible fully. They can take the sides right off. This one is semi-convertible and the one behind us doesn't convert at all. You open the windows, and of course the stuff they have nowadays, you don't even open the windows, you suffer with the heat if the air conditioning isn't working. And uh, so you have all, all different types. Uh, the ventilation was a problem and heating was a problem uh, back in the old days, of course. Um, the roof of these is kind of interesting too. This was what they call a clear story, and these windows open up uh, let me do it over here. These windows open up with the idea of allowing the uh, hot air to go out. And then there's a little ventilator along the side. But of course, they're not very effective, and I imagine these cars were fairly hot. These are open cars, trolleys, and they used to be used in Lynn, Swanskit, and Nahant. Up till around 1918, they were not good for the winter, naturally, because you couldn't be protected against the elements. Eventually, they're going to uh, extend this track to the next town, but right now it, it ends, it's about three miles. Being a member of this museum is you can bring guests with you without them being charged for it. Well, I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to uh, the Seashore Trolley Museum. This is the world's oldest and largest museum of its type. And uh, we started back in 1939 with the uh, acquisition of car number 31, which you'll get a chance to see over at the, uh, the exhibit barn. Since that time, our collection has grown to over 150 cars from all over the world. Uh, some have been restored, some are awaiting their turn for restoration. Uh, a trolley car takes a lot of work and money, unfortunately, to, uh, to restore. So we do take them a little bit at a time and as our funds allow. Uh, and you'll see a number of these cars over in the barn. Some we have restored, some are awaiting restoration. Anybody has any questions about uh, you know, anything they see here at the museum or anything about trolleys in general? Please, please feel free to ask us. Uh, if you don't know the answer, we'll do our best to try to find the right answer for you. Uh, as I said, we do have a large number of cars here, and uh, uh, quite often people will find that there's a car from their hometown here. 
The line itself is also a reconstructed trolley line. This was a, a branch of the Atlantic Shoreline Railway. Uh, covered pretty much the southern tip of Maine from Kittery up into this area. Uh, this particular branch ran from Biddeford to uh, Kennebunkport. Uh, they went bankrupt back in the 1920s, if I recall off the top of my head. When they left, they took the tracks, the wires, everything else with them. After we acquired the property, we've been putting the tracks and wires back. So uh, everything you see here on the property uh, uh, is reconstructed so by the volunteers here at the museum. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, own, we own the property all the way from here up to uh, up to the town of Bedford, up to the town line. Right. Well, we got the car ready to go back, and uh, now we need to get the people all turned around. On a keep everybody killing each other, we're going to do this one row at a time, starting with you people. If you just kindly hop to this bench. Watch your kneecaps. Oh, look at that, baby. It's like the old tight vibe. It's amazing. I think these seats were invented by a, by a bone specialist considering how they tend to smash fingers and kneecaps. <laughs> this is an example of an old blue line train that used to be on the Wonderland line, Wonderland to Bowdoin. And these were used in the 1950s and 1960s, and then they were replaced with newer cars. You also see next to it, where it says Park Street Subway, that is a PCC car, but that was a picture window PCC. Now, when I was a, in college, I thought that was the ultimate, that they would never have to invent another trolley, because it was just a beautiful trolley. It had air conditioning. But now, I think you can see that they have been replaced by the LRVs, which are the light rail vehicles. We're on the red line and we've just passed Charles River. What well, can you tell us about that? Uh, we, the Charles River is just an excellent uh, bridge. The Longfellow Bridge over the Charles River has been historically associated with Boston and the lighthouses that you saw as we went over the bridge. This is the widest part of the Charles River and then it goes into Boston Harbor right beyond the Museum of Science. It empties into Boston Harbor. But whenever they talk about Boston, they always will show a shot of the Longfellow Bridge with those famous lighthouses. And I don't know if you've noticed, as we're coming into the stations, all of these stations, these old stations, have been redecorated and lengthened so that they can make room for six cars as opposed to four and three that they used to. Yes, it seems that there have been extensive renovations. All those stations seem much cleaner and brighter. Yes, and they've all been done within about two years. They started it about two years ago, and they're just about complete. You can see as you look at the station, the bright colors, the new lighting, and they're much longer than they used to be to accommodate the longer trains of the red line. Well, we've reached Harvard Square, and this certainly is a busy place, and there's certainly a colorful group that frequents the station. It certainly is. There are people from all over the world here. It's very, very interesting. One of my favorite places, and it's got a lot of nice restaurants. Actually, what we're doing right now is we're standing right in front of the old kiosk, which used to be the entrance to the Harvard Square subway station, but since they moved it, they rented it out, and now it's used to sell newspapers from all over the world. Yeah, just a great place. It's fascinating, and I never get tired of coming here. Well, Joe and I are now standing at the exit of the trackless trolley tunnel. Maybe you can tell us exactly what is a trackless trolley. Okay, a trackless trolley is like a bus, except that it runs on electricity. You'll notice it's like a trolley car, and it uses overhead wires to get its current. And... Um, it has an advantage over a bus in that they're usually larger than the bus and they can handle more people. There is very little maintenance because there are less parts to go to break down. And of course, they're economical because they use the same electricity that the trolleys use. And um, they are not polluting. The air isn't polluted. When you, you could have a whole string of these go by and there won't be any problem, whereas if you had about 10 or 12 buses in a row, you'd end up with a definite pollution problem from the diesel fuel. This is a picture of the earliest trackless trolley that was put into service by the Boston Transit Authority in 1936. You'll notice that they're very square looking, 
And they look very much like buses, except they get their power from overhead wires. It's interesting to note that when trackless trolleys were in their heyday, which was around 1955, there were 43 routes. Right now, there are only three routes, the North Cambridge Waverly Line, the North Cambridge Watertown Line, and the North Cambridge Huron Avenue Line. From horse-drawn cars to air-conditioned light rail vehicles, trolleys have long been a part of our history. When the Eastern Mass Railway was taken over by the Metropolitan Transit Authority, or the Boston Elevated Railway, its predecessor, it inherited a number of these cars, and these cars are referred to as the Eastern Mass 4200 to 4300 class. These were luxurious cars in that they had very comfortable seats and many of them ran on the Revere Beach line from Maverick to Revere Beach. Who did invent the first trolley car? A gentleman by the name of Frank Sprague in 1888 in Richmond, Virginia invented the first trolley car. How do you think the name trolley came about? Well, streetcar it means that it traveled along the street and trolley came from the fact that the electric cars actually what Frank Sprague invented it was an electric car got its power from a, a little trolley or it looks almost like a pulley that attached itself to a wire that, that ran across a wire overhead and that's where the name trolley came from the little spindle this is the second type of trolley that was acquired from the Eastern Mass Railway when the Boston Elevated Railway took it over. These are referred to as the 4400 class and they were really the most deluxe trolley that the Eastern Mass had. They had deluxe leather upholstery. They were very comfortable to ride in. They were light enough to be used in suburban areas, and in that respect, they were similar to the Type 5 semi-convertible. They ran on the East Boston line from Maverick Station to Revere Beach, and they were also seen in the Wellington Circle line. That was the line now that's occupied or replaced by the extension of the Orange Line. These were used until around 1950. This is an example of a picture window PCC. This is the deluxe model of the PCC series of trolley cars. PCC, once again, stands for President's Conference Committee. These were types of trolley cars that resembled buses in appearance, yet they ran on rails and they got their power from a wire above. These trolleys made their first appearance in 1951 and were gradually replaced beginning in 1976 by the LRV type trolleys. LRV stands for light rail vehicles. Now I know today all kinds of people use the T, but were the people always the same? What kinds of people rode the subway then? You've got to remember that in the early days, everyone used the subway or trolleys no matter where they wanted to go. If they wanted to go to work, they would use it. If they wanted to go on vacation, they would use it. And that makes a, quite a difference because when the people in those days went to vacation, on vacation, they went on a trolley and they stayed there the whole time. And then they came back at the end of their vacation by trolley or by train. Nowadays, we have a tendency to go on vacation and travel from one place to another and not stay in the same place very long. Now, Swampscott's an excellent example. Up to 1968, when it burnt down, we used to have a resort hotel called the New Ocean House, and people came by train and trolley at the beginning of the summer, and they left by train and trolley at the end of the summer. They spent the whole summer in one place. I noticed today, and, and we spent a lot of time in subway stations and riding the T, that there's quite a culture on subways. There are certain, the people are very are unique, the subway entertainers, and of course you have the, the subway vendors. What do you say about that? Is that a whole different culture? And not only, it also acts as a refuge to homeless people. Well, today we saw a magician 
And it's not uncommon to see people playing musical instruments and requesting a donation. I find more of that uh, culture now than we did in the past. And I would say it's, you, as you said it perfectly, it's, it's a new culture, and I think we could coin the phrase, if it hasn't already been coined, a subway culture. This is an example of the LRV, or light rail vehicle type trolley. These have replaced all the PCC, or Presidential Conference Committee trolleys, or another way to say it, they have replaced the bus streetcars, or the bus-like trolleys. In most cities that still have trolleys, they use light rail vehicles. They use them, for example, in San Francisco, they use them in Sacramento, California, and in some towns that are still building trolleys, this is the kind that they will have. They have been used on the Green Line since 1976. This is the latest light rail vehicle, LRV, and it was put online by the MBTA in the spring of 1987. Now there are several modifications between this and the one that they had that they put online in 1976. The first thing is that you notice that there is a double window in front and it kind of resembles the PCCs or the Presidential Conference Committee uh, bus street cars that they used to have. The second thing is that there is an improved air conditioning system these were made by a Japanese company, and they hope to replace all the ones made by the Boeing company uh, very shortly. You'll notice that they don't seem to have a character to them the way the old trolleys used to have. They're very, they're made so that they're almost vandal proof. There's a lot of plastic and they don't have the holding straps that some of the older trolley cars had. This is the newest Blue Line train. They're sometimes referred to as the Blue Bells. They were introduced between 1979 and 1981 and are still used on this line. They are very comfortable, but still the interior is very, very plastic. They have a loudspeaking system so that the conductor can announce what station will be coming up next. This is a new Orange Line train, sometimes referred to as Orange Blossoms. They were introduced on the line between 1979 and 1981, and they're still in service today. I had a fascinating time running the subway today, and we met a lot of interesting and very colorful people. What did you think? I had a great time, and I wouldn't mind doing it again tomorrow. Of course, we don't have to do it every day, so it's kind of a novelty. It's great if you don't have to do it to get to and from work, and you can pick and choose the time which you want to do it. I wish I could have gone to the Kennebunkport Museum. Unfortunately, I was busy when you went. Well, maybe we'll go up again and invite you to come up with us. I'm sure you'd enjoy the I'd trip. I'd like that. I hope you enjoyed the program. I'm Joe Balsamer. And I'm Nancy Baldessari. Thank you very much for joining us.